Sunday evening service. Let's start by singing number 824. 824. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. We will stand and sing the first and second verse, and then we'll pray. Number 824. Let's stand and sing.
make this one our opening. <laughs> Father, thank you, Lord, for the hymns that we're able to sing. Thank you, Lord, for our Savior and how wonderful he is. Thank you for all those songs about him, all those songs that remind us of how wonderful he is and how he shed that precious blood on Calvary's tree for our sins. And Lord, we're just so thankful that one day he's coming back and we're looking forward to seeing him face to face. I pray, Lord, that you'll fill each heart here with the love of Jesus. And I pray that we'll just uh, live our lives for his honor and for his glory. And I pray, Lord, that you'll bless. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. It is memory verse time. Memory verse time. So our memory verse this month, we get an extra, an extra study week this week because it's a five-Sunday month. So next week is your due date for our memory verse, and that's uh, January 31st is when you got, to, you got to pass the test, you know, and, and say the memory verse. But tonight, all we got to do is we got to say it Technically, it's the fourth Sunday of the month. Technically, we got to say it without looking three times. So, uh, are you ready for that? <laughs> All right, am I doing? Open to my Bible. It's Psalm 46, verses 1 and 2. And if you need to look along, go right ahead. But let's say it together. Psalm 46, verses 1 and 2. All right. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Yeah, I need to look, but I think we did all right. <laughs> I even wrote it down, like this week I even started trying to write it down, and my brain's just not there at the moment. But I wrote it down on a 3 by 5 card, you know, and try my best to... But I, that was like on Wednesday. <laughs> Today's Sunday. <laughs> so there's your problem. <laughs> But let's read it. Let's say it two more times. Psalm 46, 1 and 2. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. 
All right. Psalm 46, 1 and 2. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. All right. I keep wanting to throw in a there up, but that's because that's in the next, next verse. So anyways. <clears throat> so for your announcements this evening, remember that, uh, remember that on Wednesday night we'll be having our regular uh, Wednesday night service. We'll be finishing up uh, Romans chapter 8 in our study on the book of Romans, so trust that you'll look forward to that. And then uh, the board is having a, a meeting, Lord willing, on, on Saturday morning. I got to send a confirmation email, but everyone said that the next Sunday works. So if you got something next Saturday works. So if you got something that you'd like the board to discuss, please let one of us know, and we'd love to discuss it at the next board meeting on Saturday morning. And um, other than that, next Sunday, regular services. And kids, all stay tuned for announcements. They're not, we're not ready to give it just yet, but in February, you've heard this morning, there will be Joy Club. So uh, look forward to that and uh, trust that uh, you'll pay attention to the announcements in the coming weeks. And uh, I don't know, do kids ever graduate out of Joy Club? Because that one seems a little big back there. But anyways, <laughs> all right. All right. Let's take our Bibles and go to Genesis chapter 37. I got a water bottle. Genesis chapter 37. And when you find your spot, let's stand for the reading of God's word. I I got I got my own supply. Yeah. Genesis chapter 37, and we're going to start our reading at verse number 1. And Jacob dwelt in the land wherein his father was a stranger, in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren, and the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph brought unto his father their evil report. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaf stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us, or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream, and told it his brethren, and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And his brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. Let's ask the Lord to bless his word. Our Father, I thank you, Lord, for this passage of Scripture that introduces us really to this young man by the name of Joseph. And Lord, he was such a godly young man and such a good example for all of us here tonight. And I pray, Lord, that as we Uh, Look to the Word of God tonight and see what is written about Him. I pray, Lord, first of all, that we'll be directed to our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. 
and that we'll be made to see the things that you'd have us to see concerning him and be made more like him. And I pray, Lord, that we'll take the wonderful truths and apply them to our hearts and lives. Ask, Lord, that you'll fill me with the Spirit, Lord, to preach your word tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> tonight we're back in the book of Genesis, beginning a series on the life of this young man by the name of Joseph. We've been kind of going through Genesis a little bit every year for the past few years. We went through uh, the first 11 chapters of Genesis way back in 2016. Then we, a year or two later, we went through uh, the life of Abraham, la- then the life of Isaac another time, and last time we, were, we, looked, or no, we looked at the life of Isaac and Jacob together, and that was last year. And so this year, uh, Lord willing, we'll be going through the life of Joseph, and this series is entitled The Dreamer. And Joseph's story is really one of the most exciting stories in the Bible. It's one of those stories where you go from, well, you go from the the pit to the palace and everywhere in between. It's a story that you see the heartbreak of life, you see the joy of life. You see all of it mixed together in this beautiful story of Joseph. But more than anything, when you consider the life of Joseph, I want you to remember that Joseph's whole life points us to the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Joseph is perhaps the most Christ-like of all the Old Testament characters. Joseph, his whole life, points us to the Savior. C.H. McIntosh says, There is not in Scripture a more perfect and beautiful type of Christ than Joseph. Whether we view Christ as the object of the Father's love, the object of the envy of His own, in His humiliation, suffering, death, exaltation, and glory, In all, we have him strikingly typified by Joseph. And when we go through the life of Joseph, we're going to see from the very beginning here, this story from chapter 37, all the way to the end, that Joseph points us to Jesus. He reminds us of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so tonight, in these 11 verses that we just looked at, I want you to realize that even here, Joseph reminds us of our Savior. You say, I, I've read those verses all my life, and I've never, ever thought that it pointed us at all to a type of Jesus. That at all reminds us of the Lord Jesus Christ. But it does. Joseph, or the Lord Jesus Christ, at his baptism, the Lord said, the Father said, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. You know what Joseph is here in these opening verses? He's the beloved Son. And so tonight, as we look at Joseph tonight, I want you to see him as that beloved son. Number one this evening, consider his purity, Joseph's purity. The fact is, in the Bible, other than our Savior, of course, there are only two people that I can think of of whom much is said, but of all that, nothing bad is ever said of them. Nothing ever is said of them that they did wrong, that where they erred. There's Daniel, who we mentioned a lot this morning, and there's Joseph. Joseph, from everywhere we see, he was, his character was impeccable all throughout his life. And Joseph, he was, we see his character as he was tempted by Potiphar's wife day after day after day. Joseph never gave in. In all his suffering, he never sinned against God. When she grabbed his coat and took, off, took his coat, he took off his coat and ran. He lost his coat that day, but he never lost his character. He was a man of integrity a man of character, a man of purity. But I want you to know that his integrity didn't start when he was standing before Pharaoh at 30 years old. When you look at him right at the beginning, Joseph was a boy of integrity, a boy of character with high standards. You notice in these verses that we just read, number one here, that he was separate from his brothers. He was separate from his brothers. I think of how at the end of Jacob's life, he's giving blessings to his children. And he says about Joseph, blessed is he that was separate from his brethren. And we think of Joseph being separate from his brethren when he was sold into Egypt and he spent those, it was about 20 years in Egypt without his family. And we say that's the time when he was separated from his brothers. And obviously he was then, but Joseph was separated from his brothers right at the beginning. Before he was ever sold into slavery, Joseph already had separated himself from his brothers. 
In our text this evening, we see Joseph at 17 years old. 17 years old, and he's already a responsible young man. 17 years old, and he is feeding the flock with his older brothers. Specifically, he's with the, wives, the sons of the concubines, Bilhah and Silpa. Specifically, he's with Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Those are the four boys that are mentioned in verse number two. And Joseph is teamed up with them as he watches his father's sheep. And his brothers, they, they weren't up to any good. They were up to no good. Uh, we don't know exactly what it was that they were up to, but the Bible tells us that Joseph brought to their father their evil report. He told the, his dad about the things that his brothers were doing that weren't right. And you know, I can tell you that this doesn't surprise us when we know what we know of Jacob's children. Jacob's children, we know much about them and not much about it up to this point and even for the next few chapters, not much of it is good. Reuben, the eldest, had lain with his father's concubine. Levi and Simeon committed the great crime in Shechem. We, we already have, know that his brothers, they weren't righteous boys. They weren't concerned about integrity, about purity, about doing what was right. And now Joseph is keeping the sheep of his father with his four older brothers, and it's no different. He brings them their evil report. And the thing that gets us about Joseph is that even as a 17-year-old, he never joined in, you know? He never partook of those sins. He never joined in on the sins that his brothers were committing. And I think you realize how rare that is, don't you? You understand how rare it is for a young man not, not to go with the flow. I think we all understand that uh, the sins of the world around us are, are, are increasing all the time. And we all understand how difficult it is for young people, how difficult it is for young Christians to, to grow up in this world and to see all the sin going around and to not partake, to not join in. But a young person, you don't, you don't have to. You can be like Joseph. You don't have to join that crowd. You don't have to walk with sinners. You don't have to go that way. You can go the way of the Lord. Joseph did it at 17 years old and all the way up before he was 17 years old. And the ones that were leading him astray or trying to lead him astray, they were his own brothers, his own siblings. But Joseph didn't go with them. He was separate from his brothers. And the idea that tells us in the text, or Joseph was a young man, sorry. Joseph was a young man who what the Bible says, he simply didn't follow after youthful lusts, you know? These other guys, they were all interested in what felt good, what they wanted to do. It was all about me, all about I. This is what I want to do. But Joseph was a young man of integrity. And the Bible says, rather than joining with them, he brought to his father their evil report. And uh, this is where I mean, we're only two verses in, and this is where many people start to find fault with, jo with Joseph. Who does that? Who is he to tell on his brothers? I mean, don't you know what they call that kind of person? That person that goes to daddy and, and tells daddy what a brother did? That's a goody two-shoes. That's, that's, a, that's a tattletale. Some might even call that kind of person a rat, is what they call them today. And uh, you hear that all the time. The police are always struggling to find witnesses and when crimes are committed because nobody wants to be that rat. Nobody wants to be that person that squeals to the police and tells what crime was committed. And everybody today is like, don't be that one that tells the wrongs that have been done. And I just can't help but wonder, what's wrong with us that we're so accepting of sin? What's wrong with us that sin can happen and we can be okay with it? That we can think that's okay, let's just sweep it under the rug, let's just ignore it, rather than getting sin dealt with. Since when were we so dismissive of sin? To think that it's okay to just let it go and ignore it as if it isn't there. You know, do you know that in the Old Testament law that if one of God's children were to hear a brother of Israel if they were to hear him curse God, 
that young man that heard it was responsible to go and tell the elders. If he didn't go and tell the other elders, he literally would suffer the same penalty, the same punishment as the one that committed the deed. God is very serious about dealing with sin, about confronting sin. He's against sin. And why are we so okay with it today? You know, we look at Joseph and we say, he was a, he was a busybody. That's none of his business to tell his daddy what his brothers were doing. That's none of his business to, to go in and spread, spread, spread around the crimes that his brothers had done. Except Joseph was doing exactly what he should have been doing. For starters, he was their brother and that was their father. If a brother is going astray, don't you think that the father should know about it? Joseph wasn't being a busybody, a gossip. He was telling the right person. He was being a good son. He was being a good brother. Acting like the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. After all, a gossip is someone that goes and tells the information to the wrong people. You know what people will do? They won't tell the right person, but they'll tell everybody else. I'm not going to tell the person that can make a difference, but did you hear what they did? Did you see what happened over there? Did you see what my neighbors have done? Can you, can you believe what they're doing over there? And Talk all about it to everybody else, but the person that you should be talking to it about. Joseph wasn't spreading it around like wildfire. He went to the boss. He went to his dad. They were working for his father. It was his father's sheep that they were working with. It was his father's responsibility. It was his father's reputation that was on the line. And Joseph was simply telling the person that needed to know. He wasn't being a gossip because gossips typically don't tell the truth. They, the story grows. The story becomes exaggerated. They, they lack an accuracy of the details. They don't give an honest report. But that wasn't the case with Joseph. As shameful as it was, it was the truth. These were his brothers. This is what they had done. And he was telling his father a truthful account of all that had gone on, of all that had happened. And he brought his father their evil report. And you understand that that takes guts. It takes guts to have that kind of character. Do you have that character? Do you have that integrity to stand up for the right? You know who testified about the sin of this world to their father? That's what the Lord Jesus Christ did. John chapter 7, verse 7, he says, The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth, because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. He brought our world's evil report to the Heavenly Father. Just like Joseph brought the evil report of his brothers to his earthly father. He was a type of Christ showing his purity. He was the beloved son. He was separate from his brothers. Number two here, as we consider his purity, we see that he pleased his father. He pleased his father. Now this is, this is the next big problem we have in the story of Joseph. And this one is a is a lot more egregious to us as we read verse number 3. It's nothing that Joseph did wrong here. But look at verse number 3. Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age and he made him a coat of many colors. That's not much I can say about that, you know. <laughs> yeah, Jacob had a favorite son. And his name was Joseph. We all understand that parents should never have favorites, okay? I know my, my mother's favorite, but, you know, who can blame her, you know? But <laughs> parents shouldn't have favorites. And I'm not my mother's favorite, okay? But if she had a favorite, if she were to pick one, we know where she'd lean. <laughs> I, just, I wink, and then she, she just laughs at me and don't, doesn't get anywhere. I've tried to be the favorite, but it hasn't, hasn't gone well so far. But... Um, you know, we all realize that if a parent actually has a favorite, that doesn't go over very well. That causes rivalry with the brothers. That causes chaos in the home. To think that this one would be his mommy or daddy's favorite. And if anyone should have known the problems that it causes, it, it should have been Jacob. Let's be honest. Jacob grew up in a home where his mother had one favorite. That was Jacob. And his father had another favorite. That was Esau. 
And we see how the conflict arose when they were, when it was time to bless the kids and the dad wanted to bless Esau and the mother snuck in and got Jacob the blessing and Jacob had to run for his life to Pan and Aram because his mother had intervened with her favorite and her father's favorite. It was just a big mess. The favorites. And uh, we read this and we say, Jacob shouldn't have had a favorite. And we look at Jacob and doing what he does here and we say, well, you know, it says he was the son of his old age. And we understand that Joseph was the, he was the second youngest of Jacob's kids. The youngest, Benjamin, when he was born, the mother passed away. So maybe that was a sad spot. So Joseph was the nat- natural favorite there. I don't know. We remember that Joseph was born to his favorite wife, Rachel. That his birth was a tremendous answer to prayer as Rachel was begging and begging for this child to be born. And finally, Joseph was born. And we get it how, uh, and we saw when Esau came and Jacob feared and he lined up his family in order of who was most important or least important to most important. You remember that? He had the, the children of the concubines at the front. Then he had Leah and her children. And then he had Rachel and Joseph. Kept Joseph nearest to him. They were the nearest to his heart. And I mean, we, we get it, but you know, who in the world would have a favorite? We, that's not something that you do. And uh, we disagree with that, of course. But I want to tell you this. I don't disagree with Jacob giving Joseph the colored coat. I don't believe that Jacob made a wrong decision here in verse number three when he gave the colored coat to his son Joseph. The Bible says, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children. It says, Because he was the son of his old age. And we take that as it means that he was the son that was born when he was the oldest. So Jacob was, it's believed he was 91 years old when jo- Joseph was born. And so because Joseph was the last one born, Joseph became the favorite. And that's how we take it to be. But if that's what it meant, that Joseph was the favorite because of how old Jacob was when he had him, then Benjamin would be the favorite. Because Benjamin was actually younger than Joseph. And so Benjamin, the baby in the home, would have been the one to have received the colored coat. But I'm actually told that that phrase... That phrase, he was the son of his old age, doesn't mean that he was so old when he was born. But what it means is that that son was a son that had what we'd call wisdom beyond his years. It's a reference to the maturity of the son, a reference to the character of Joseph when it calls him the son of his old age. It's the idea of a son who has an old head on young shoulders. It's a description of a son who is wise and prudent. And it's not actually a description of how old Jacob was when he was born. And so it was a common expression, I'm told in Hebrew, that was always used to denote a wise and prudent son. And so Joseph, his father loved Joseph. Now he shouldn't have had a favorite, but at the same time, we understand why. Because Joseph was a son that did the things that pleased his father. Joseph was the son that did what was right. I mean, you've gone through the life of Jacob and looked at his sons, and you've seen the crimes that they've committed, and you can understand why Jacob wouldn't want to give them the colored coat. But Joseph, he did the things that pleased his father, and he was a son who was like the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Because after all, what did Jesus do? He did his father's business. He said in John 6, 38, I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. He said in John 8, 29, I do always the things that please him. And that's what Jesus did and were to be like him. And that's what Joseph did. Joseph was a son of purity. He was a son that did the things that pleased his father. And so we see from that that that's what leads to his privilege in verse number three. Not just Joseph's purity, but Joseph's privilege. And verse number three, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children because he was the son of his old age, and he made him a coat of many colors. And the colored coat, this is probably the most famous of all clothing in the Bible. 
I think that you've always heard the story of Joseph's colored coat. They've made uh, movies and musicals of Joseph with that colored coat, and it's an image that everybody remembers is the colored coat that Jacob gave to Joseph. And needless to say, it was a special coat. Uh, It's specifically mentioned. That alone signifies that it was significant. It's mentioned as a gift to show a special love. That shows that it was significant. I'm told that this kind of coat was a very special coat made with many pieces of different cloths put together, and it was a very valuable coat. And if you're wondering about how significant it was, there's no easier way to tell than just by looking at his brother's reaction. The fact that Joseph had this coat, and they they saw by that coat his father's love for him more than them, and they hated him for it and could not speak peaceably unto him. This coat was quite the ordeal. And so let's think about the coat here. What did it signify? First of all, here, this privilege, this coat, it spoke of Joseph's authority. It spoke of rank. Uh, For the ones that worked the fields, this coat wasn't one that was given to the common laborer. His brothers were still wearing the clothes of common laborers, that regular uniform, that regular outfit, that there was nothing special that the laborers had to wear in the field. But the one that wore that colored coat, he was in charge. He was the boss. He was the one that was the administrator out there, the supervisor out there. He was the one that was in charge. And can you imagine? Can you imagine if you were the older brother, the oldest brother, and you're the ten older brothers, and the eleventh born, the literally the elving of the family. That's my... uh, a name that's in my wife's family, that means the 11th child. And uh, the elving of the family was there, and he was the one that got the special coat. And you say, my goodness, what is up with that? How would, how would he get the special coat? How does he deserve it more than me? And can you imagine your baby brother being the boss? It's my baby brother's birthday tomorrow, and I love my baby brother, but I, I don't know if, it, if my... If we were working in the fields and my mother said, now Mark's in charge, me and Matt would be looking and saying, what's up with that? (laughs) He's the baby. He's not going to boss us around. He's not going to tell us what to do. But Jacob gave Joseph the authority in the fields. That's why you see him a a little later on in the chapter going to Dolphin to, to check in on his brothers, wearing that coat as he goes. Because he's there to supervise. He's there to report back to dad on what his brothers are up to. Report back to dad. He's his father's eyes out there in the field. He's his father's voice out there in the field. He is there with his father's authority. And the older brothers did not like that. And I think we can all understand why. It spoke of his authority. But another aspect of it is it spoke of his brother's faults, didn't it? It spoke of his brother's faults because the fact is this coat, it was always, 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 always given to the firstborn. If it wasn't given to the firstborn, then it was a shock to the family. This was something that always went to the eldest child, not to the eleventh child. Even if the father did have a son that he maybe liked a little bit better, he wouldn't, oh, he wouldn't overlook his oldest son and not give him the colored coat. But Jacob did. Well, you've got to understand, his oldest son had sinned greatly. His older son had lined with his, with, his, with his concubine. And Jacob, because of the sin that Reuben had committed, he, he didn't want to give Reuben the coat. Uh, the next two, well, then to say, okay, well, the oldest son, he, he committed a, 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 a sin against you. Well, give it to the next son. Give it to the next guy. Yes, because Jacob's business is the mafia, and that's the kind of guy he needs. Seriously, don't you know the sins that Levi and Simeon committed? They're the next two. If he doesn't give it to Reuben, and you say, give it to the next oldest, the next oldest is Levi and Simeon, the ones that killed the whole city of Shechem. The ones that committed the great tragedy, the great, the great uh, travesty that we saw 
in Genesis chapter 30, I believe it was, or Genesis chapter 31 or 32. He wasn't going to give it to them. The next one is Judah. Judah, we, we saw a little bit before Christmas, the sin that was going on in Judah's life with his family and with his wife and, how he, and what happened there with him and Tamar. And so when you get that far down the line, you might as well just give it to the son that's going to do right. You might as well just give it to the son that will do the things that please you. And so Joseph was given the, the, given the coat as he was the son that was wise and prudent. He was the son of character, the son of his old age, the, the son with wisdom beyond his years. And so he got the coat because his father loved him more than him because he was the son of his old age. He was the son that was doing right. And so he gave him the coat of many colors. And so they hated it for him for it. We see in the Bible, in this text here, how his brothers hated him. I, I, I think how they must have started hating him in verse number two, when he brought his brother's evil report to their father. In verse number four, they or verse number four, they hated him when they saw the colored coat. They saw that and they couldn't speak peaceably unto him. And then that leads us to verse number four, where we see Joseph's promise, where Joseph dreams these dreams and he tells them to his brothers, and they hate him yet the more. Verse number 5 to 11, we see Joseph's promise. It says in verse 5, And Joseph dreamed a dream, and he told it his brethren, and they hated him yet the more. And he said unto them, Here I pray you this dream which I have dreamed. For behold, we were binding sheaves in the field, and lo, my sheaf arose and also stood upright. And behold, your sheaves stood round about and made obeisance to my sheaf. And his brethren said to him, Shalt thou indeed reign over us? Or shalt thou indeed have dominion over us? And they hated him yet the more for his dreams and for his words. And he dreamed yet another dream and told it his brethren and said, Behold, I have dreamed a dream more. And behold, the sun and the moon and the eleven stars made obeisance to me. And he told it to his father and to his brethren. And his father rebuked him and said unto him, What is this dream that thou hast dreamed? Shall I and thy mother and thy brethren indeed come to bow down ourselves to thee to the earth? And the brethren envied him, but his father observed the saying. You read this account, and uh, I don't know if you're like me, but many times on reading these verses, I have come away with the question, what was Joseph thinking? <laughs> you know? What is he doing going to his brothers and telling him those dreams? Doesn't he know that they're, gonna, they're not going to like that? <laughs> Doesn't he understand that when he tells a dream of the 11 sheaves, representing, of course, 11 brothers, we, we can all count, uh, bowing down to him, that that's speaking of them bowing to him? Doesn't he understand the sun, moon, and the 11 stars, the 11 stars representing his brothers, that that means they're going to be bowing to him from his dreams? Doesn't he know that they're not going to like it? <laughs> I mean, his brothers didn't like the dreams. The text tells us even his father didn't like the dreams. He was his father's favorite. He was the one that his father loved. But his father, the Bible says, rebuked him. It's the idea that he yelled at him, what are you saying, Joseph? You shouldn't be saying these dreams. Not even his father liked the dreams that he was, that he was telling. And we read this and we say, he shouldn't have told them the dreams. And I've said many times, he shouldn't have told them the dreams. But let's not forget that these dreams were from God. Let's not forget that these dreams were God speaking to Joseph. The fact is, Joseph lived in those days before the scriptures were written. In fact, he's in the first book of the Bible, so we can deduce that there were no books of the Bible. Now, maybe, I don't know when Job was written. Job did happen beforehand, but I doubt that it was penned down yet, but maybe it was. But uh, he lived in that time when there were no scriptures and how God spoke to his people in Bible times was through visions, through dreams, through things like this. And Joseph, I, I know, had heard how Jacob had been spoken to God by a dream and how he had, Jacob, his father, had seen the, the vision of the ladder descending and descending with the angels of God, ascending and descending to, 
heaven on Jacob's ladder. He had heard the story of Abraham and how Abraham had visions of God and walked through the fire and all these different things and how God had spoken to his fathers. And so he understood when he had these dreams, he understood that these weren't his thoughts, these were God's thoughts. These weren't his words, these were God's words. God was speaking through his dreams. And Joseph knew it. And can I tell you that they knew it. And that's why they hated it so much. The fact is, Joseph tells us later that the dream was doubled because God had established it and it would shortly come to pass. God doubled this dream to Joseph right here because he had established it and he was going to shortly bring it to pass. And it was only 20 years later when these events actually were fulfilled. And God was speaking to Joseph. And we all, they all knew it. And we say Joseph shouldn't have told them the dreams, but is anybody allowed to hear the words of God and keep them to themselves? Are any of us to have the word of God and not share it with others? The fact is, if you have a message from God, you're responsible to tell it. Imagine if a preacher decided, I'm a preacher, but I'm only going to say the things that are popular. I'm only going to preach the things that people want to hear. I'm only going to say the things that make them feel good. I'm only going to say the things that, that, that make them like me and make them love me, rather than tell them, as Peter and Paul told them, the whole counsel of God's Word. The fact is, we are responsible for what we do with God's Word. We are responsible to share it, responsible to preach it, responsible to give it to others. We're responsible to be like Joseph and to tell the dreams that God has given us from his word. And the fact is, it, we can always say it's, but it's easier. It would have been easier to keep it to ourselves. For Joseph, it, it would have been easier. It would have been easier to just act like he woke up that day and he hadn't dreamt a thing. Act like he woke up that day and and, and tell, talk to his brothers like any other day and just ignore the fact that he ever had a dream. It's always easier to keep it to ourselves, to act like we have no treasure within, to pretend like we have nothing to say. It would be easier to hold our tongue and to say nothing for our Lord because then nobody would hate us, you know? Nobody would speak ill of us. Nobody would harm us. If we just kept God's word to ourselves, if we just kept silent, the pot wouldn't be stirred, the persecution wouldn't be faced, the storms of our faith wouldn't come. Just think, if Joseph hadn't have said those words, there would have been no pit. There would have been no prison. There would have been no time of slavery in Egypt if he just had have kept silent. Except God gives us his word and it's like a fire within, you know? Jeremiah, he received God's word and he told God's word to the people and he suffered for it. He's the weeping prophet. They persecuted him. They hated him for the prophecies that he was given. But he says in Jeremiah 20, verse 8, he said, Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. But his word was in mine heart as a burning fire shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing, and I could not stay. And the fact is, God gives us his word because he wants us to preach it. He wants us to share it. He wants us to tell it to others. And we say it would be easier not to share it. Friend, it would be, it'd be so difficult not to share it. It would be so difficult to keep it bottled within when God is working in our hearts to get it out. And the miserable person is the person that has God's word and they hide it. And they say, no, I'm not going to share it. I'm not going to tell others. He gives us his word so we can tell others what he has to say. And we read this, and we, all we think about, though, is but those dreams, that they caused Joseph so many problems, didn't they? I mean, he had the dreams. He told his family, and it just added to their animosity towards him. He was thrown in a pit. He was sold as a slave because he told his brothers his dreams. Look at the persecution those dreams caused. But I wonder tonight, have you ever considered the comfort those dreams gave? Have you ever considered the consolation that those dreams were for a young man 
shut up in a Rome, in an Egyptian prison. Have you ever considered Joseph? I call this text, this series, the dreamer. And that's because I believe these dreams right here at the beginning, I believe these dreams played an integral part in the story of Joseph. Joseph is a young man that went from the pit to the palace, everywhere in between. He was a slave. He was falsely accused. He was imprisoned. He was forgotten. He up to, before we even see him in this text, he's already suffered. He lost his mother at a young age. He, he doesn't see his family for many years, maybe wondering if he'll ever see them again. And all the way through, you see Joseph as a young man who never complains, never gets bitter or angry, never speaks out against God. Literally, there, there's not one bad thing said about Joseph and his response to his trials in all the Bible. He's a type of Christ. He faced these challenges with great poise, great character, great faith. And he did it all before the scriptures were written. I think of you and me, we go through tough time, and you know what we grab onto? We grab onto the Word of God. We memorize passages that passages like the one we're memorizing. God is our refuge and strength, a, a very present help in trouble. We grab ones like Romans 8.28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to His purpose. We grab these passages, and we quote them, and we go over them, and they get us through tough times. But what did Joseph have to get him through all of that that he went through? What did he have to get him through all that suffering? I'll tell you what he had. He had the dreams. These dreams right here was God speaking to him. Those were God's promises to him. Those were God telling him to keep pressing on. Those were the words of God given to him to give him hope when he was sold as a slave, being sold there to Potiphar in Egypt. There were his dreams that he held on to when he was in Potiphar's house and he was falsely accused. It was the dreams that got him through those years in prison where he was the best prisoner they ever saw. It was those dreams that got him through when he was forgotten for two years after he had interpreted the butler's dream. God had given him those dreams when he was 17 years old, and they saw him through. And because he had the dreams, they took his colored coat, but they couldn't take his dreams. They sold him as a slave, but they couldn't sell his hope. Potiphar's wife falsely accused him and threw him in jail, but she couldn't alter God's plan for him. The butler could forget him and erase him from memory, but he couldn't erase God's dreams, God's words that he had given. And it was the dreams, the promises that God had given him that gave him strength to endure. And friend, we have a whole Bible a whole Bible filled with promises. And I was thinking of Romans chapter 8. We went through it on Wednesday night, the middle portion of it. And Paul was saying, if we suffer, we will be glorified with him. And I tried to handle that passage of Scripture. And I said, well, we suffered with Christ when he died. But I wasn't happy with what I said. The fact is, that passage is implying that we all are suffering. You understand that? As God's people, as we go through this world, we are suffering. There, there are challenges. There are trials that every single one of us, as, as Christians, as people, all of us have. But we go through them with Christ. And we suffer with Him. And because we're going through it with Him, we have the hope of glory, the dreams that God has set before us. We hold on to that. It's a hope that anchors our souls. Our confidence then can't be shaken because we've built our life on the rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. And when the storm comes, we're not shaken because we've built our life, as Jesus says, on his words. And that's what Joseph was like. And you know who he was like? Well, in every aspect, Joseph is like Christ. Because no one suffered like our Savior. As he paid the penalty for your sin and mine. To think that he who knew no sin was made sin for us. And you say, how did he do that? How did he endure that? Well, the Bible tells us it was the joy that was set before him. The joy, the word of God, the promises that were given. That's what got our Savior through. It was the promises of God that got Joseph through. And if you'll hold on, it's the promises of God they'll get you through too. Joseph is a great example for us. He had purity. He had privileges. 
Because of that, he was persecuted, but he had God's promises, and he endured. And we see him at the end come out on top. I wonder, will we be like Joseph? How confident are you in God's promises? Don't you know that God still answers prayer? Don't you know that God's still at work today? I love the story of Adoniram Judson. I'm still working on getting the name there for the next baby if it's a boy, but I'm probably not going to win that one, but, you know, we'll see. Um, <laughs> the fact is, I might be able to fill out the birth certificate without my wife being close by. And I'm <laughs> just kidding. But uh, Adoniram Judson was a great missionary, and he suffered much. And one day, he was in Burma, and he was there with 32 pounds of chains on his ankles, they say. And he had, wasn't being that, at the beginning, he wasn't that successful as a missionary. They say he actually went six years without getting a single convert. And so he's there in Burma, and he's got those chains on him, and someone sneers at him and says, Mr. Judson, what's the prospects of converting the heathen? And he looked at him, and he said, they're as bright as the promises of God. <laughs> and they say that after he left Burma, there were hundreds of thousands of Christians from the missionary work that he had done. You know, God still has given us promises. The question is, are you holding on? Like Joseph did. And I'm so excited to see how God's promises kept him through all these pages. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, thank you, Lord, for the opening text here of the life of Joseph. Thank you, Lord, for what a wonderful example he is of purity. Thank you, Lord, for how you blessed, how he was blessed because of it. And I thank you, Lord, for how he received those promises and how he held on all the way to the end. And we're so thankful, Lord, for um, the example he is, and I pray, Lord, that we will follow that example, that we'll hold on to the promises of God in this dark and dreary world. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Is there someone here this evening that needs to know the Lord as your Savior? If that's you tonight, just raise your hand, and I'd love to take a Bible and show you how you can be saved. And also, Christian, at this time, why don't you take some time to pray and talk to the Lord? Anybody that needs to be saved, though, just raise your hand. Our Father, thank you for the time we've had. I pray that now you're blessed in this closing hymn. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. closing, let's take our hymn books and go to number 434. Number 434. Thinking of Joseph, all the while not letting go of his dreams, and they kept him singing, you could say. And for us, Jesus, he, he keeps us singing.